So I'm Paul Geringer. I'm a senior faculty specialist and extension specialist in Ag and Resource Economics. I'm also a part of the Agla Education Initiative. You can find our stuff there. None of this is legal advice. You've all heard me and I'm on tape back in the back saying that, so I'm good. I think for the rest of the day I can just say anything and rely off of that for everything that happens today. The last thing I want to say is we have a 30 to 40 minute survey because I know you really want to take a survey for that long. Looking at estate planning and succession planning needs, you can find it at go.umd.edu slash estate survey or you can scan that QR code and if anybody wants it, I can get it to you at the end. But you're eligible if you complete all of it to win one of eight $50 gift cards. So I'm trying to at least incentivize some of you to take it. Let's go ahead and get started with this. So we're going to cover a couple of developing legal issues and then at the end, I think at the end, I put this PowerPoint together and I think I put it at the end. We'll talk about pesticide litigation update. How many people see the Camp Lejeune water ads? I hate to disappoint you guys. I'm not talking about Camp Lejeune water today. So if you need to learn more about that, do not talk to me about it. I do not want to learn about any more class actions that are being advertised on television as I have had to do. So we'll talk, I, most of the cases I'm going to talk today about are involving the poultry industry. How many people know what the Fair Labor Standards Act is? It's a federal law that dictates how we basically pay employees, treat employees. It basically says if you do a job you get paid minimum wage. There are ag exemptions within that law. If you work over 40 hours a week you get overtime. Unless you fall under one of the ag exemptions, then you don't. This is impact hitting the poultry industry. There have been two lawsuits filed, one in South Carolina by former growers in South Carolina for AMIC, and then one by a South Carolina or former South Carolina grower who sold to Purdue Farms in Georgia. The plant was based out of Georgia, so they are suing in Georgia. Both claim that the integrators, in this case, violated the Fair Labor Standards Act. Their argument is basically, and I think it's on the next slide, yep, their claims are the growers are actually workers for Purdue or AMIC and are not independent contractors as your contract states. What does that mean? Well, if you're an employee, you have to be paid a minimum wage. So their argument is the tournament system does not provide a minimum wage. For anything you do, it falls well under the minimum wage that is required by whatever South Carolina in both cases. And at the same time, they should have been paid overtime in some of this. The issue with that is almost all of this would be ag labor, which is exempt in almost all states from overtime under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So that one's still not clear how this one is going to go forward on at least that claim but at least one court is allowing it to go forward for now. <clears throat> the other thing to point out with this, if none of you knew what the Fair Labor Standards Act is, how many people have actually heard of the Employee Retirement Income and Security Act? I told you, we're going to get really, really boring in this presentation because we're going to now talk about what the Employment Ret Employee Retirement Income and Security Act says. This is a federal law that requires if you have employees of a similar class and you offer them benefits, you have to offer all employees in that group benefits, the same benefits. So within the university we have groups of employees who are excluded from benefits pool because we can classify them over here this way. They're excluded. They're not required to get these benefits. These, at least in the South Carolina case, they are arguing that because the growers are employees and AMIC offered benefits to all their other employees, they are entitled to health insurance, retirement, dental insurance, everything else that would be offered to a normal employee. So this is the more interesting litigation that is ongoing to claim that growers are not independent contractors and are now employees. Oh, yeah. I need to point this out. At this point, none of them have been certified as class actions. All of them are seeking to be certified as class actions. 
Um, that could happen this year. It depends. One has, the Georgia one has survived the motion to dismiss, which is pretty standard within all litigation. You survive usually the first motion to dismiss, and as the case goes along, it may potentially get kicked out. In a lot of what went on in that one, the court looked at it and said they just didn't have enough information at this point because they didn't understand who all the potential class members could be, what their contract said, even though the contract's gonna be pretty standard. They needed to see more class members come into this to see how that one proceed. AMIC, the AMIC one has not really proceeded that far yet as well. And I say this, there's some case law out there that may actually back up some of this, but it's not as clear in a lot of cases that they're citing. And this one I have to thank Jordan for, for sending me right before I left on Christmas break and wanted to take like time off and not think about legal stuff. So we have a Tennessee lawsuit brought by environmentalists against two poultry farms that were established in Tennessee. They are suing Farm Service Agency, Farm Credit, Mid-America, the two poultry growers who then tight contracted with Tyson. As I talk about the rest of this, no one included Tyson in the litigation and it still confuses me why Tyson's not included in this litigation. The groups claim that because Tyson has complete control over these two poultry farms, Tyson does not meet the definition as a family farm that would qualify for a USDA loan guarantee. So both of these farms went to Mid-America, got a loan or got loans to buy the not to buy the property, to build the houses, and as a part of that, they had to go to USDA to get loan guarantees to back that up. How standard is that within people starting poultry houses? That's pretty standard, isn't it? That's pretty much the way it works. Why does it work that way? You didn't know I was also gonna call on you to answer questions this early in the morning, did you? On a Friday, no less. Do, do these growers typically have collateral that's going to back up any of these loans? No. Or may they have the credit history to do any of this? Probably not. So the bank really wants to get paid if something goes wrong. So they usually ask them to go get loan guarantees and see if they're eligible for them. So the groups are claiming that throughout all of this, Tyson doesn't qualify under any of the regs, under anything to be a part of the loan guarantees through FSA. They're also arguing that these two farms that are directly across the road from each other, owned by two individuals, they are, may or may not be related. They have the same last name, but the complaint is not clear in how they're related. Um, USDA screwed up and they should be one farm and they should have only given them one loan guarantee. That one seems like a loser of a claim because we can clearly show it's two separate farms. It's clearly two entities, so this one seems a little bit wrong. This is basically saying, look, if you disagree with us on the fact that Tyson controls this thing and controls everything, and they still qualify, the two farms still qualify for the loan guarantees, USDA screwed up and should have only issued one loan guarantee in this. The final thing that came about out of all of this in looking at it is USDA failed to complete the NEPA review. Where else have we seen this in the state? Was there another case that happened in the state for those that have kept up with stuff involving the same thing? Yeah, very similar to one that happened in Caroline County a few years ago involving a poultry farm. So, okay. let's go back to this. Huh. How many people know what the National Environmental Policy Act is? Few people in the room do. The National Environmental Policy Act is a law from the 70s that regulates nothing that you do in the country. All it says is if US, not USDA, if the government's going to do something major, they have to do an environmental analysis of it and they may have to do an environmental impact statement depending on how big it is. Within this, USDA at one time had to do this review with all loan guarantees that came in. USDA had to go out and do an environmental review 
of every poultry house with a loan guarantee, not just with poultry houses, anything they were going to do a loan guarantee on, determine there was going to be no impact. If there was an impact, determine what the mitigations were going to be to lessen the impact from that. Put together a report, allow public comment on that report, go back with the public comment, determine if anything needed to be changed, and then issue the loan guarantee. That is not an easy process to go through. And I can't remember if I put the slide in here or not, but if we, I didn't, I'll get to it on the next one and we'll talk about it before I move on, about some of the changes that happened three years ago, a little over two and a half years ago, actually, on some of that. So the first dispute with the loan guarantee, very similar to the claims in the class action litigation. Basically claiming Tyson controls everything, these people are employees. That's the more interesting one that's going to move forward. And they're not independent contractors. The NEPA claims are the more interesting one. In September of 2020, what all was going on September of 2020 for those that remember anything in the news? COVID, probably other stuff, but most of us just remember COVID. The Trump administration earlier in the year had announced proposed rules to basically change NEPA and how the NEPA regulations worked for the first time since 1978. I was born in 1979. Nothing with NEPA had changed in my lifetime until well, three years ago. Within that, they exempted FSA from loan guarantees because USDA had no control over any of these projects. They were just loaning money potentially to a group if something bad happened, they would end up becoming the person that got paid back and having to pay money out. They had no control, they didn't have anything really, they were just in the role of a lender. So there was a push to move them out because this was becoming an area where groups were suing under, so this is where we saw some movement to push, push out. Um, at this point, the Biden administration has not changed anything. They've actually let these go forward. They've made some other minor changes, if I remember correctly. But they have not done anything to this. In fact, as I looked at this case, I made myself go look at the NEPA re regulations just to make sure nothing had changed. FSA loan guarantees are still clearly exempt out of this. So the question is, and I've been trying to figure out is, A, looking at this, Based on the timeline, why did Tennessee Farm, or Farm Credit, or not Farm Credit, Farm Service Agency do a NEPA review if they were exempt and try to figure out what was going on at that point to make this happen? As I just said, trying to figure that out because that's kind of the fascinating part is to figure out why that is because it seems like this was the last claim brought in the litigation and for those that have never had to look at a court pleading before, the last thing you always bring is usually your loser that's going to get kicked out probably. So this is the one that's more interesting just to see how the court's going to kick it out. And the other thing to point out is in the Maryland case, it took time to get to this, but the group eventually had no standing to actually bring this challenge. Who knows what standing is in court, and it's not what I'm doing right now. <laughs> Few people do. You actually have to be a person that has an interest that the court can actually provide relief to for any case you bring. I can't just sue somebody for a random thing that, I have, that has no impact on my life. I actually have to be able to be able to bring that litigation, and the court actually has to be able to redress it. In this case, at least in the one we had here in the state when it went through the DC circuit, they had no standing because even if we went back four years later, five years later, and determined, yeah, FSA messed up the NEPA review, let's go back and make them do it. Is the lender actually gonna make the borrower go get a loan guarantee at that point? There's no guarantee that you're actually going to have to go out and get the guarantee. So the court actually can't do anything to redress what you're asking them to do by asking them to go back and fix a process that existed at the time. 
you can make a very similar argument here that this is probably going to get kicked out on that too, at least that part. Part of the other stuff is more interesting and I'm curious how that proceeds. The one part that is the most interesting is if you're claiming Tyson is you know, not eligible for any of this and you don't sue Tyson, it seems like you've left a very indispensable party out of the litigation and we really need to get them potentially added in because leaving them out still is unclear to me why that strategy was taken. I've now bored you with poultry stuff. Do you want, do you, assuming now we can talk about the fun stuff and the pesticide updates. As I said, we're not going to talk about Camp Lejeune, but how many people have seen Roundup ads? You may be eligible. All of this litigation is based around a products liability claim. Products liability is nothing more than negligence. The idea with negligence is a product or us as individuals have a duty to do and perform within ways that do not hurt other people. With products liability, the idea is we're marketing a product, we say it's safe to use in this way, if we follow all of these directions, the product is safe. They are claiming within this, and when we talk about the other litigations as well, at least Paraquat, the argument is that the products are actually not safe for what you're claiming they can do. So all of this is based around the argument that Roundup glyphosate causes cancer. Um, it all started out of state court juries in California. Those are basically the sums that were awarded to parties in that. This has led to the class action lawsuit, and this is the most recent data I can find is as of December of last year. Bayer has settled nearly 100,000 cases and paid out $11 billion in this litigation. The court on multiple times has rejected a settlement offer that both parties have come up with for various reasons. So Bayer has had to go out and negotiate each one of these individually with each one of the people. It is expected there is around 26 to 30,000 cases still outstanding left to settle. And you know the only way we figure out most of this? Guess where Bayer has to file all this in the end? It all goes in their corporate filings when they have to do their quarterly finance statements with the SEC. So there's statements in there where they're talking about some of the litigation expenses that where most of the media is pulling this out of and where I'm finding some of it when I'm looking. The other thing to point out is this term, the Supreme Court had the opportunity to hear a case involving one of the original California cases the, where the decision was because of this and Bayer failed to warn, warn on the glyphosate label that this product could cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So my first question on that is who controls within federal pesticide issues the label? Yes. The person that said EPA is correct. EPA tells us what can go on the label and EPA has to approve the label. Can a California state court tell Bayer what to put on their label? No. They can't. They had argued this that under the federal laws that control pesticide regulations within the US, California couldn't do this so this court, this case should be thrown out. The Supreme Court refused to hear it. So that is pretty much ended that issue for now. So we still really don't know what the outcome on that would be. That's where we're at with Roundup. Dicamba drift, most of that, that settlement has been paid out. The only thing that's left kind of outstanding are some individual court cases that came before the class action in last year, I think about the summer. The Eighth Circuit vacated one involving the punitive damage, damage award to a Georgia peach farmer and that was against, if I remember correctly, Bayer and I cannot remember the other company ever off the top of my head and I should have put it in my notes for my slides. The basic argument was this, when the jury went 
to go decide this punitive damage claim. The judge gave a bad instruction to the jury. The jury looked at both companies involved when there was only evidence against Bayer and held them both accountable for the $60 million verdict. So the court has to go back, redo the punitive damage claim, and give them a better instruction to where they have to look at the companies individually and they have to look at them within the standard that fits within the law. You only get punitive damage when certain things are met within the law depending on the state. And in this case, and the companies were claiming they were, this was misapplied and it should have been applied individually to each company and not just with one standard for both. The new one that everyone will probably be seeing and has already started to see on TV is Paraquat litigation. This is a new class action. I say it's new. It started about two years ago, I believe, where it's still a products liability case. The idea is that within this, it is linked to Parkinson's and higher rates in Parkinson's by use. This is in the initial phases and still, again, class action. It's against Syngenta and Gravon. So that is where we're at with that. There's not a lot there to talk about at this point. And I was expecting Jordan to go longer, so I didn't bring that many <laughs> slides. <laughs> so I do a blog where you can find stuff on carbon markets, all of the poultry stuff I talked about. I really try to avoid the pesticide litigation because class actions confuse me, especially products liability class actions. That's not what I went to law school to end up doing in my life. Um, that's at agris.umd.edu. And then you can join this with Southern Ag Today as well. It's another daily blog. I'm Jeff Harris, manager of Nutrient here in Centerville. Thank you all for your business. Uh, you know we're full retail, custom app, anhydrous, everything you need. The two things that I wanted to bring up to everybody's attention that Nutrient has done is uh, we now have drone scouting. So everybody does have diff different ways to scout. Um, we use a third party. The system uh, works off of a Israeli intelligence system from the government that uh, you could, if they wanted to pinpoint a, one person in a 100,000 crowd and take them out, they could do that. So how this drone works is, um, it gives you a stand count over your farm if you need to do a replant or you don't or you think about replanting, you don't have to. We did have a situation last year where we had a grower that thought we were going to replant and he ended up having, he planted 33,000, he ended up with a 28,000. It calculated that out and we did not have to replant. Uh, there's a three or four plan flights. You can do a uh, the three plan, four plan would be uh, stand count, another 10 days after that, and then like a V5 and then a tassel. Um, so just give you guys where the scouting programs are going. I don't know if, if anybody else is doing that, but we do offer that, um, and you can get with us. It's a, it's, it's, it's a ten dollars an acre cost for all for the plan. It's not per flight, it's, it's for the plan. So if anybody's interested in signing up some acres, you know, be glad to give, give, get with myself or any of my guys. Um, there's also an app on the phone that when the flight is done, it sends it directly to you guys and myself. We get it all at the same time. Um, it also works off of algorithm where it identifies weeds, bugs, and deficiencies. So the more it works, the more it tells itself, the more it identifies. So it can identify palmer, it can identify manganese deficiencies in, in, in your crops. So as it flies, once the, once the information comes in, it identifies everything. So if anybody's even remotely interested in that, we did have several growers were signed up last year and they did like it. Um, feel free to uh, get with me and my guys. The only other thing real quick is we also offer Navigate Rewards through Nutrien. 
on any of our products that, that you buy. I know like, you know, you guys have heard of Bayer Rewards, Syngenta has AgriEdge, Nutrient offers Navigate Rewards. What that is, is based off of Loveland products that we carry and also other suppliers. You know, Syngenta's got a few products that are on there, Bayer has a few products that are on there, and you just calculate points for, and you can go online and buy a jacket or buy a, I don't know, whatever. There's millions of things. To be completely honest, you, these, these points can accumulate so much over the years, you can go on a cruise. So anybody that's, that is dealing with Nutrien or wants to deal with Nutrien, just know that we have a system that you can get free stuff through what you buy. So, um, again, if you want to, you know, if anybody wants information on that, we'll have it at the table. So thank you guys very much. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jeff. And we'll be bringing up our sponsors in between. So next is our very own uh, David Parks is here to give us a pesticide update from MDA. So thanks, David. Here's your clicker. I got this on. No, oh, yeah, we got it. All right. Thank you. 